into a little pouch that she carries around up inside of her. So she will be carrying the sperm of several males with her, and she'll mate maybe for the first day or two, and then she doesn't mate anymore. And she carries that sperm with her, and, and it's alive inside of her, and as eggs are, are, are laid, she then doles out that sperm and uses it to fertilize her, her eggs over the rest of her lifetime. Do not think about this in human terms. Okay, just think about it in insect terms. If she's getting old, or if she's getting sick, or if the sperm is bad, or she's running out of sperm, sometimes you will see part of the egg mass is fertilized, and then the last bit, or the first bit, doesn't get fertilized. And we're seeing a lot of that this year that we had never seen before. So we don't know if there's diseases coming in on that female, or maybe the males are of poor quality and their sperm isn't any good anymore. I don't know. But it's the antifreeze. It's all the males being exposed to antifreeze. You're right. I'm disrupting the male population. It's my evil plot to go against the males. And this bottom egg mass here is exactly the same. We have a lot of them that didn't get fertilized, a few that hatched, and then we even have some that are dark that made it. You can see a head in, in there, but the egg mass didn't hatch. And maybe that got sucked on by another insect or is one of the beneficial insects. So we're getting partially hatched egg masses. But if you really want to kill an egg mass, there's nothing better than fungus. And these two egg masses have been killed 100% by fungus. And unless you're an entomologist and you walk a lot of fields, you may not realize how many insects, like soybean aphid, spider mites, all these different kinds of caterpillars, how many of them in, a, in an actual year are killed by fungus. So when you use a fungicide against a plant disease, that's fine if you have a plant disease. But Dr. Bird said earlier, don't just use something if you don't need it. And part of that is there's a lot of fungicides out there that when you kill the plant disease, it also kills the insect disease that was, that was killing uh, spider mites or soybean aphid or even these kinds of things. So we're starting to see some fungi come into the system and, and kill eggs. So instead of 100% hatch this year, we had about 80%. 80 uh, so I move a lot of egg masses around. I can go to corn, I can find them, I cut out the egg mass, and I can then pin the egg mass onto a different plant. And one study I did this year was that last year, when it was cool out, I saw a lot of real short plants, like, like up to my waist, had egg masses on them. Most of the time, the insects are attracted to pre-tassel corn, where there's a tassel surrounded by a leaf, and they like to lay their egg right on that leaf that's around that tassel. And when the tassel is emerging and the eggs are hatching, they like to eat pollen. In very short corn, they don't have pollen, they don't have silks, they don't have a tassel to feed on. And I started to wonder, should you also be scouting really late planted or delayed fields if there's egg masses there? So I pinned egg masses onto short corn and then watched them hatch. And then I went back and cut these corn plants apart every so many days to see what happened to those larvae. And the people in the front can see here is a newly hatched larva right on the top of a whorl, and it, the larvae have chewed little tiny holes, little microscopic pinholes through that whorl. So one day after hatching, they are on that plant alive. Three days after hatching, everybody was dead. They, and they, I literally, they were stuck onto the plant dead and nothing ever emerged out of those world stage plants. So I think on really short corn, where there's no tassel, there's no pollen, there's nothing juicy and good for them to eat, they can't eat leaf tissue. The interesting thing is, I'm not gonna show you dry bean data. If you come to the dry bean meeting, uh, my colleague Fred Springborn in Montcalm County will show my dry bean slides. But in dry beans, we never can find them. We don't know where they go and my students cut apart dry bean plants right after the eggs hatched, and where they're hanging out when they're little tiny dudes is in the blossoms. They're actually eating the flowers of the dry bean plants. So they're eating reproductive tissue of, of the plant, probably because there's more nutrients there. So the same in corn. I think you need to have corn that's at least pre-tassel or tasseling with pollen uh, for them to get by. So to control this insect, I mean, one option is spraying, but probably nobody up here has sprayed for western bean cutworm, correct? I don't think I've been any place yet where anyone has, has sprayed. 
The other option is to use one of the BT corns, and a lot of you are getting BT corn now, uh, for, and there's many different types of BT corn, and it's getting very, very confusing. So I've done a couple studies in Montcalm County this year, just looking at efficacy with western bean cutworm, trying to assess not only our threshold that we have, but the types of BT corn that are out there. And depending on the BT corn, they each produce a different toxin. So some of the types of BT corn that are now out there, this is the DT Triple Pro from Monsanto, and it is geared to kill European corn borer. And it has a double toxin. These toxins are getting really confusing. I actually carry a laminated sheet in my car that tells me what each of the toxins are and what it does and which company makes it. And the DT Triple Pro has no Western bean cutworm control, or very, very little. It would be the same, it's, it's a different toxin, but the same with the, the old yield guard protein from Monsanto. There is no control of Western bean cutworm. It's a, it's a corn borer product. The Herculex type of trait from Pioneer has Cry1F, and Cry1F was also selected to kill corn borer, but it sort of also kills Western bean cutworm. I would say that the efficacy is similar to if you were going to, to spray. So if you plant Herculex uh, as a protection for corn borer, you will get some western bean cutworm control, and it would be, it would be substituting for a spray, ap uh, spray application. Now Smart Stacks corn, which, came, which was available last year, is a combination of Monsanto traits and Dow traits. So Monsanto has brought in to the smart stacks, it's brought in these two uh, proteins, the same that are in the BT tri triple. It's brought that in for corn borer control. And from Dow, it has Cry1F. So because it has Cry1F in it, it has some control of Western bean cutworm. And pe people have asked me, well, which is better, Herculex or smart stacks on Western bean cutworm? They're, they're the same. When you put them side by side, they perform the same against Western bean cutworm. Now the last product is from Syngenta, and it's a, it's a BT that is very new. It has never uh, been in corn before. It's very different. It acts different, and it's called the VIP gene, V-I-P, VIP-3A. And VIP-3A uh, is interesting because it's not a corn borer protein. Corn borers can eat that, and they will survive. VIP-3A was specifically designed or selected to kill other caterpillars in cotton and, and in other crops. So when you, when you purchase a VIP-3A uh, Ag AgriSure hybrid, it'll have like the yield guard trait in it or something for European corn borer, but this VIP gene is super against Western bee cutworm. I've never had it in plots, they've never given it to me to have in plots, but I've seen plots with it in it. And from what I've seen, the protection against Western bean cutworm, I would say, is very good. It would, it, it would be better than what you could get with, with a spray. So now you have uh, a whole bunch of different things that, that you need to consider as far as BTs. You have BTs that do nothing, you have BTs that do something, and BTs that are, that are quite good. So when you choose a hybrid, I would still choose, your, your hybrid is made up of dozens or hundreds of, of, of genes that interact with the soil and the water and the environment and the weather and pests. I would choose the best hybrid for your farm and then understand which type of BT it has in it. I, I wouldn't choose the hybrid just based on the BT, but understand what you're getting when you get that hybrid. So I'm going to show you one efficacy trial. I'm not going to show you all of them, just one so you can see the kind of damage that we have in Montcalm County in the center of the state we're near potato, we're near dry beans, and we're on very sandy soil here. And my treatments in, in this particular trial, I have a non-BT, I have the triple pro that doesn't do anything against western bean cutworm, and the smart stacks, which is pretty good. And this is natural flight. These are natural egg masses. Here's an egg mass, here's the tassel leaf here, and it's being laid right here. So I'm going to show you natural infestation. I did not cause this. This is an irrigated plot, so it's actually pretty attractive to Western bee cutworm. And um, this, this field happens to have first generation corn borer too. It's near, it's near potato and it's irrigated. 
So I'm going to show you some first generation corn borer uh, counts too. And I'm scouting these plots every week, 50 plants per plot. So the plot is bigger than like normal uh, MSG plots. It's like eight rows. It's probably not quite as long as this room, maybe to the ends of the table. And I'm scouting 50 plants in there. If I was going to tell you to scout, I'd tell you to scout about 100 plants in, in your whole field in a couple different places. So I'm, I'm doing a, a pretty good job of scouting here. And this is planted uh, the first week of May. So first, this is the Western Bean Cutworm Trap Catch at this site. We're getting up to about 150, 175 moths in the middle of July. My pre-tassel stage, which is very attractive for the, uh, egg, the egg laying, begins at about the 7th of July. I'm at late pre-tassel on the 14th, meaning I can see the, the tassels just starting to peak out there. And historically, when I've scouted fields, those are the plants that the females really like to lay eggs on at, at night. Uh, tasseling and pollen shed by the 20th, right at this top of the peak. And by the 27th, about here, my pollen shed was done and the tassels were drying up and the pollen was kind of drying up on, on, the, on the plant. So you see a nice peak in my little milk, in my milk jug traps. Now I'm going to overlay bars that show you the uh, number of egg masses that I found across this, this total study. So here's, when, as I'm scouting, how, each week, how many egg masses am I finding? So I start finding them on the 7th of July, a whole bunch of them on the 14th and the 20th. And even though here I have a lot of flight, uh, by the 27th, it's, the egg laying is shutting down. The females are no longer interested in this field. They're going to go across the street or down the road or to dry beans. They're going to go find...